back again with another video for New Worlds November. If you're not familiar with New Worlds November, it's a brand new reading event created by the Bookish Bryants. I'll have their channel linked in my description below, as well as the channels of all the co-hosts. Uh, its focus is science fiction, or more specifically, short science fiction. The idea is to get people who have never read science fiction uh, to pick some up and give it a try, and for those who don't read it very often, to give them an excuse to read a little bit more. Each week has a different science fiction theme. Week one is aliens, week two is AI and robots, week three is time travel, and week four is uh, post-apocalyptic or dystopian. So it is actually the first day of week two, which is AI and robots, but I am a little bit behind. So I am about to talk about my second read for Alien Week, which was Frozen Hell by John W. Campbell. I'll have the title image here for you. And it comes in at 76 pages. The novella is actually 124 pages, but the first 23 are an introduction and the last 24 are actually a couple chapters from the prequel to this story, which I have not yet read. This novella actually had a couple movies made based on it. The first one is called Who Goes There, I believe, which was also the title that the story was originally published under in Astounding Magazine. And I have not seen that movie. The second one was called The Thing and came out in 1982. And I have seen that one. And I did re-watch re the movie just a couple of days before I read the novella. I wanted to see what the differences were. So if you've seen The Thing, then you know this story. They are the same in all the ways that matter, with the exception of the ending. The endings are quite different. Uh, but the setting and the atmosphere are identical. And the feelings that you get from the alien are also the same, uh, with perhaps the movie being a little more violent and gory uh, than, the, than the novella was. If you're not familiar with this at all, it's a story about a group of scientists who are based in Antarctica. And they find an alien frozen in the ice. So they dig it out and bring it back to their camp. And as it turns out, the alien is not dead. And when it thaws, it just wreaks havoc in the base <laughs> and with those men. So my favorite thing about this story were the first about 50 pages of it. I found them to be really exciting and really engaging. John W. Campbell has some wonderful descriptions of the setting uh, that he somehow makes both beautiful and ominous. And I have an example of that for you here. From horizon to horizon, the blue ice of the bald plateau stretched out under winking stars, the calmest and clearest air they had seen since reaching this windswept dome. The northern horizon was barely washed with rose and crimson and green, the southern horizon black mystery sweeping off to the pole. The auroral lights wavered in shimmering curtains about them, intensified slightly off to the northeast, in the direction of Big Magnet Base and the Magnetic Pole. The brightest stars had dancing crystalline duplicates in the sparkling ice underfoot. Off to the west, the ice contracting under the cold gave a ripping crack, and a succession of spreading lesser reports as the strain was eased. "'Be hell if one of those relief cracks strikes through the camp,' muttered Barkley. "'We've weakened the ice cutting into it here, so it might.'" See, I just loved the way he described this beautiful scene and then wove in this threat of the ice cracking uh, in their camp. I just, and there are several sort of descriptions like that where he, he shows how beautiful it is, but he also makes it very clear that they are in a precarious environment. So I thought it was so well done. The other thing I really enjoyed in that first 50 pages were the descriptions of the aliens. There's quite a few for the number of pages, and I just wanted to read you my favorite one. So in this scene, the biologist who has not yet seen the alien is getting his first glimpse. That's our pretty beastie, Doc. We have got to dig the damn thing out. Ugh, damned is right. That thing belongs in this sunken pit in the middle of, of a frozen hell. It isn't quite so bad here. The glittering ice under the rather unreal light of that flare. Copper shook himself. Hell of a thing for a medical man and a scientist to say, but I don't want to dig it out. It's a member of a race far more ancient than man's all right, the biologist nodded. The developments would indicate that. Strange, though, the way first sprouts on the flesh. Looks almost active now, as though it had been just beginning when the creature froze here. But it's not so bad. It has a rather uh, unpleasant expression. 
but it's as much a child of nature and her strange moods as are men or dogs or, or the large al algae that somehow managed to live down here where no other living thing is. Unpleasant, grunted Cop Copper. I suppose we have to get that thing out and start investigating the ship. I hope Baldwin doesn't get a look at this thing. If that artist ever gets this burned into his brain, his pictures are going to be unholy things. We've got to cut this loose. Barkley's starting the tractor, and by the time he gets up steam, we ought to have this and its surrounding block of ice cut loose. Vane slid down the shaft in a shower of ice chips. Like our pet copper? Ugh! I'll get over my damned curiosity after this. Is Norse handy up there? He is. Ask him to throw down a tarpaulin or something. I'll work better with that face covered. It isn't ugly, Vane pointed out judiciously. In a way, though those three eyes are rather startling, and that hair, I guess you'd call it, though it may be an organ of some unknown sense. Anyway, it may be startling, but when you come down to it, the features are rather fine, almost classically fine. Hell is ruled by a fallen angel. Copper turned toward the metal wall of the ship. <laughs> I loved, loved, loved that whole interchange about this alien. I loved how the men just thought the thing was so hideous they could barely even stand to look at it. And the biologist is trying to sway them away from that and trying to get them to step back and take a look at it, you know, for what it really is and not just with their biased human eyes. <laughs> I just love that whole thing. So yeah, these first 50 pages, they were so good. There were a lot of other descriptions in there that I enjoyed. Uh, there were also quite a few humorous moments. There were actually some humorous moments throughout the whole book. Uh, but as much as I really enjoyed that first 50 pages or so, the rest of the story felt a bit disjointed. Uh, I had trouble keeping track of exactly what was going on uh, at some points in the story. And the characters were another thing that confused me. There were quite a few characters for being such a short story, and I couldn't keep them straight. I think part of the problem was he might have been going back and forth between calling the characters by their first names and then their last names. Uh, and possibly even there was might have been a nickname or two in there. I'm not really sure. For example, Vane, who is um, a prominent character in that first 50 pages, is not mentioned at all in the entire rest of the story. Like It's just like he dropped out of the story with no explanation, but he could have been being called by a different name. Like if Vane were his last time, maybe he was calling him by his first name or vice versa. I'm not really sure. But overall, I was really happy with the story and did really enjoy it. And uh, the ending was much different than the movie ending that I saw. The movie ending had a definite type of ending. And in the novella, I thought it was a little ambiguous. It could have been interpreted as a sort of happy ending, uh, a happy ending of sorts, but it also could have been interpreted as an ominous ending. <laughs> so I felt that it may have been purposely left that way for the reader to decide or wonder about. The other thing I noticed in th this story, or I should say that I couldn't really decide on, is what John W. Campbell's intention was. I felt like we were probably supposed to empathize more with the human crew and the scientists because they are continuously referring to the alien as being evil and being selfish and just being awful. But I will tell you, I actually empathize more with the alien. This poor alien crash lands on Earth. He's from a planet, or at least the scientists are theorizing that he's from a planet that is much, much warmer than the Earth. So I'm, I'm imagining a more tropical type setting and it crash lands in the middle of the Antarctic. <laughs> you know? And so it makes it out of its ship only to freeze solid and exist alive in this semi-conscious state for a hundred thousand years or more. And then a primitive race comes across him, finds him, digs him out, and then blows up his ship, which is his ride home. And since they say the ship was big enough that, that it had to at least have uh, at what they theorized was at least 10 other beings, that means they also blew up his friends, his crewmates, you know? So, and then drug back to their base and treated like it's a, a zoo animal, essentially. So I think if I were this alien, I would be pretty angry too. And I would be viewing humans as being evil and I would be doing everything I could to get out of their power. So uh, I had a lot more empathy for the aliens than the human crew. And I'm not so sure that that was John W. Campbell's intent. So that's pretty much all I 
uh, had to say about that story. I do know a couple of, other, of the other hosts for New Worlds November uh, did videos on this story, and so I will link those uh, down in my description.